Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're checking out our first GeForce RTX 4090 partner card, the Gigabyte Gaming OC. And like all 4090s, this thing is massive. I'll do my best not to refer to it as a, a beefcake, a slab, brick, cinder block, behemoth, or everyone's favourite thick boy more than about a dozen times in the video. I can't promise anything, but I'll certainly do my best. So yeah, we might as well get it out of the way, the dimensions. This large graphics card measures 342 millimeters long, which isn't the craziest dimension, but it's still around 20 millimeters longer than what you'd typically expect to see for an extreme high-end graphics card. It also stands from the PCIe connector 145 millimeters tall, which is again, pretty common for a high-end product but it is the width that's supersized here. Normally a thick graphics card, that'd be around, let's say 55 to maybe 65 millimeters wide. But what we have here is a 75 millimeter wide monster that'll take up four expansion slots. Given those dimensions, it probably won't shock you to learn that it weighs 2004 grams. And that's a lot of weight to place on your PCIe slot. Addressing this concern, Gigabyte has included an anti-sag bracket, which connects to the backside of the graphics card and braces it to the case's motherboard tray. It's a neat idea that doesn't spoil the appearance. Speaking of the appearance, let's take a closer look at the RTX 4090 Gaming OC before tearing it down to inspect the PCB and cooler. The front side of the card is wrapped in a black plastic shroud with three large 110mm fans embedded within. And I guess you could say the fans are backlit with RGB rings using what Gigabyte calls RGB fusion. Anyway, the RGB effects on offer here look pretty cool. And there are a number of customizable options available via the Gigabyte Control Center software. The fans are brushless models made by PowerLogic, though I couldn't find any information on the specific models used here. Generally speaking, these fans aren't that costly to replace though, should they fail outside of the warranty period. Though replacing them yourself will require a good amount of experience as you have to tear down the entire graphics card to disconnect the fans, it is quite an involved process. The shroud design here is fairly plain. The LED lights certainly help to dress it up, but if I'm completely honest, it looks and feels a bit cheap, dare I say it. There's a lot of plastic on display here. And granted, plastic fan shrouds are kind of the norm, but on such a massive graphics card, there's an overwhelmingly large amount of it. And I think given the price, it does feel a bit cheap and looks a bit mid-range. The outer facing side of the card is really no better in that respect. The GeForce RTX branding in silver looks pretty cheap in my opinion, and certainly doesn't scream premium $1,600 US product. The Gigabyte branding behind the mirror finish looks a lot better, but I feel it is spoiled by the awkwardly placed GeForce RTX branding. Looking past the fan shroud though, there's no missing the absurdly large array of aluminium fins that line the graphics card. Never before have I seen anything quite like it on a graphics card. Embedded within the fins is a 16 pin PCIe 5.0 connector and Gigabyte recommends you bring at least 1000 watts when using the RTX 4090 gaming OC. So that's 150 watts up from Nvidia's FE model. The only other noteworthy feature here is the dual BIOS switch that allows the user to select between the default OC BIOS and a silent BIOS. The dual BIOS is an essential feature for any mid-range to high-end graphics card, so Gigabyte ticks that box. However, I should note my sample had the exact same BIOS version loaded on both modes, so silent was no different from OC. Moving around to the back side of the card, we find a massive full-size aluminium backplate. There's a few random cutouts with a large air pass through towards the end, about the size of one of the 110 millimeter fans. And then of course there is more Gigabyte and GeForce RTX branding here, which looks okay, certainly much more tasteful than what we saw on the side of the card. Then around at the IO end of the card, we find a trio of DisplayPort 1.4 outputs and a single HDMI 2.1 output. Now, Gigabyte's only included a two slot bracket here, whereas Nvidia's FE model used a triple slot bracket. And this appears to be the case for most custom 4090s as well. So it is a bit disappointing to see Gigabyte only use a two slot bracket, but perhaps for their design, there was really no advantage to going for a three or even a four slot mounting bracket. Now, time to take the cooler off. And this is a pretty straightforward job. It requires the removal of just 10 screws, and then you can pry the cooler off. And I do mean pry it off as the plethora of thermal pads generates a tremendous amount of suction. Basically anything on the PCB that could have had a thermal pad on it 
has a thermal pad on it. The PCB itself measures just 231 millimeters long and 141 millimeters tall, so it is quite compact given the overall dimensions of the card, but then Gigabyte does have that huge pass through area. As for the power delivery, we have 20 power stages in total for the GPU with another four for the GDDR6X memory, all using Vachet SIC 653A 50 amp power stages. Now the backplate is very thin, especially given how large the surface area is. I can't imagine it really offers that much in the way of rigidity, but at least Gigabyte's using it as a heat spreader by connecting it to the backside of the PCB using thermal pads, which help to extract built up heat from behind the GPU and GDDR6X memory. As for the cooler itself, it weighs 1540 grams, and that means almost 80% of the graphics card's weight is in the cooler, which probably won't surprise that many of you. Then with the fans removed, the weight of just the heatsink comes to 1183 grams. Now at the heart of the cooler is a large copper vapor chamber, which directly contacts the GPU die, extracting heat and then feeding it into the 10 six millimeter copper heat pipes that are soldered to its surface. Also connected to the copper vapor chamber is an aluminum heat spreader that connects to the GDDR6X memory. And there are also a series of heat spreaders that are used to interface with the VRM components. It's an impressive cooler. It's a quite a simple design, but an impressive cooler all the same. It appears to be well built and therefore I expect that it will cool the gaming OC graphics card very well. So to find out, let's go over some stress test results. Here's a look at how the gaming OC operates after an hour of Hitman 3 at 4K using the maximum in-game quality settings. These temperatures were recorded in a 21 degree room installed inside an ATX case with the doors closed. Here we see that the GPU hotspot hit just 76 degrees, though the fan speed was reasonably high at 2000 RPM and this generated 44 decibels of noise. The average GPU temperature peaked at 67 degrees and the memory at just 64 degrees, which is very low for GDDR6X memory. So the big gigabyte cooler is certainly working exceptionally well. And for reference, the memory on the NVIDIA Founders Edition ran 18 degrees hotter under the exact same test conditions, while the GPU hotspot was seven degrees hotter. That said, the FE model was two decibels quieter, but even so significantly increasing the fan speed probably won't result in an 18 degree reduction for the memory temperature. Another variable to consider is the fact that the gaming OC was clocking higher, and as a result, the power draw increased from 419 watts on average from the FE model to 442 watts, so a 5% increase in power there. This allowed for an average clock speed of 2740 megahertz, while the memory ran at the standard 21 gigabits per second. Now time for some overclocking. By default, the gaming OC has a 450 watt limit, but the BIOS will allow for a maximum of a 133% power limit, and this will allow you to go as high as 600 watts, which is higher than most custom 4090s that I've seen. And there could be some interesting information around the power limits of various 4090s and what they're meant to do and what's going on there, but that's something we'll explore a bit more as we get through the rest of these partner cards. So with the power target maxed out, I got overclocking. This allowed my gaming OC to reach a stable core frequency of 2,940 megahertz, which resulted in an average power draw of 508 watts, while the memory peaked at 24 and a half gigabits per second. This increased the GPU hotspot temperature by seven degrees to 83 degrees, and the memory temperature to 68 degrees, just a four degree increase there. That said, the fan speed was now ramped up to 2300 RPM, and you could now quite easily hear the graphics card over the case fans, but it wasn't alarmingly loud. Certainly nothing like what we used to witness from reference cards, for example. So even overclocked to the max, the gaming OC was surprisingly manageable. Now, as we look at more and more RTX 4090 graphics cards, we'll have a lot more graphs comparing all the data. But given this is our first partner card review, there's not a lot to compare with, and therefore we don't need a dozen or so graphs to compare all the different metrics. So with that, let's move on to a few quick gaming benchmarks, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Now, here's a look at the stock and overclocking gaming performance for the Gigabyte RTX 4090 Gaming OC. Testing with Cyberpunk 2077 shows the Gigabyte model to be just a single frame faster than NVIDIA's FE version. So in this example, a mere percent increase. It's the same situation with both models overclocked and with 89 FPS on average, that's a 6% boost over stock. So hardly worth the messing around and potential stability issues in my opinion, but that's been graphics card overclocking for quite some time now. Our overclock netted us an additional 7% performance in Hitman 3, going from 183 FPS to 195 FPS. 
And again, the Gigabyte Gaming OC was just a single frame faster than the NVIDIA's Founders Edition model. Finally, we have Watch Dogs Legion, and this time the overclock resulted in just 5% more frames, topping out at 150 FPS, which was the same limit reached by our FE model. When compared to NVIDIA's own Founders Edition graphics card, I don't feel there's much of an improvement here in terms of cooling performance, despite Gigabyte's model being physically much larger, though overall it does weigh a little bit less. So that concludes our look at Gigabyte's RTX 4090 Gaming OC. It is difficult to say just how good this model is relative to other partner cards, given that it is the first model we've actually looked at, and at this point in time it is also yet to go on sale, so how close to the MSRP it's priced is also yet to be seen. Also at roughly the same operating volume, the GPU hotspot temperature will be about the same, so the only real advantage Gigabyte had here was the much lower memory temperature, though both did successfully overclock the memory to 24.5 gigabits per second, so perhaps the temperatures here are a bit of a non-issue. In terms of design and aesthetics, the Found Edition is a very sleek and elegant looking product, whereas the Gaming OC is not the most premium looking model. It's very plasticky, but when active, the LED effects are impressive. So if you're into that sort of thing, then the Gigabyte design will be a lot more appealing. I do like the Gigabyte anti-sag bracket. It looks good, as in you don't really see it. And most importantly, it works well and is easy to install. I do wish though that Gigabyte along with MSI and ASUS would come up with a design that allows for easy removal and installation of fans, similar to Sapphire's Fan Quick Connect, for example. Of course, being that this is a GeForce RTX 4090, the performance was impressive, and although the recommended Gigabyte specification called for a 1000 watt power supply, it ran for days under load using our Corsair RM850X without an issue, and total system draw even when overclocked was less than 700 watts, which includes the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D, and well, everything else in the system. So with all of that said, should you buy the Gigabyte RTX 4090 Gaming OC? Well, honestly, I wouldn't advocate for buying any RTX 4090 before we see AMD's RDNA 3, see what that has to offer, and we should get to do that next month. But if you are dead set on going with Nvidia's $1600 GPU, then we see no reason not to buy the Gaming OC. But of course, it's certainly worth checking your options, and we will have the ASUS Tough Gaming version uh, on the channel very shortly. It probably in about two days from now, I think tomorrow night, a day after this video goes live, Tim will have his DLSS3 analysis. You're absolutely not going to want to miss that, so make sure you subscribe for that. But yeah, the uh, the Tough Gaming does look like a really impressive model, so you're going to want to check that out. And of course, we have like five or six other 4090s to uh, go over, so there's going to be plenty of options there. Worth checking your options if you are dead set on going for an RTX 4090. Anyway, I'm going to end the video there. I think we've we've said everything we need to say about the gaming OC. Uh, again, make sure you subscribe. You're not going to want to miss our DLSS3 analysis video. And if you'd like to become a Hardware Unbox community member, then we do have Floatplane Patreon. Links for those are in the video description. You'll get access to our exclusive Discord server where Tim and I talk with you guys about all things tech and not tech, I suppose. We also do our monthly live stream where we do much the same live. Uh, Q&As, behind the scenes content, a lot of cool stuff there. So if you're interested, check it out. But if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again next time.